Welcome everybody. Welcome to All Apart APT10 Professional Engagement Forums and today's session on communities. Thank you for joining us. My name is Pippa Dixon and I'm the Director of AsiaLink Arts at the University of Melbourne. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which AsiaLink at the University of Melbourne is located. The Wurundjeri, Wurrung and Boonwurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation in Nam. I recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and to all First Nations people on whose land we work across Australia and the Asia Pacific. And I would especially like to acknowledge all First Nations people joining us today. Craig Gomer's 10th Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art, APT 10, marks a considerable milestone in the organization's history as it approaches 30 years of working with artists, commissioning new works and developing collaborative projects that celebrate the geographic, linguistic and cultural diversity of the Asia Pacific. This series of forums initiated with our partner Quag Goma and the amazing team behind the 10th Asia Pacific Triennial of Art, Tarun Nagesh, Ruth McDougall, Ruha Fafita and Ruben Kean, and all the team in the background provides an important juncture for artists and arts professionals in Australia and the Asia Pacific to come together to reflect, share and connect. At each session, we are delighted to be able to welcome 20 bursary recipients, a small group of passionate and committed emerging Australian-based artists and arts workers. And we sincerely thank Westspace for supporting the promotion and distribution of the bursaries. We hope that these sessions encourage the development of networks and the seeding of future collaborations that invest in international engagement and partnerships. All Apart has been made possible by collaborative, curatorial and conceptual development. And we'd also like to thank the Griffith Asia Institute. AsiaLink is grateful for the assistance provided by the Australian government through the Australia Council and its arts funding and advisory panels. Please note that each session is being video recorded and we'll be sharing these on YouTube following all three events. The session also has um, transcription service and please choose the tr transcription button on your screen. And while we know you are incredibly busy, we would like to invite you to remain until the end today so that you might benefit from meeting other attendees here and sharing your thoughts. So a quick recap on the format. We have two short 15 um, to 20 minute presentations, a 40, roughly 45 minute panel discussion, and then uh, about a 20 minute breakout group um, conversation at the end at approximately 4.35. In each of those breakout rooms, we'll have a moderator. And I'd like to especially thank special guests who are assisting us. Last week, that was Dr. Wulan Dirgantoro, lecturer in art history and curatorship at University of Melbourne. Dr. Chaitanya Subrani, associate professor, Center for Art History and Art Theory at ANU. And today, very special welcome to Dr. Samid Suleiman, Senior Lecturer in the School of Humanities and Languages, Social Sciences at Griffith University. It is now my absolute pleasure to hand over and introduce Ruth McDougall, Curator, Pacific Art at Quagoma, who will introduce today's session and the speakers and moderate the panel. Thank you, Ruth, and over to you. Thanks so much, Pippa. Um, thank you everyone for attending today. It's wonderful to have um, so many people in the room online. My name is Ruth McDougall. As Pippa said, I'm one of the curators here at the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery Modern Art, who cares for the conversations and relationships that we have with artists, artworks and communities in Oceania. I'm speaking today by the waters, under the sky and on land that's been cared for by Jagara and Turrbal peoples for centuries. Um, and I acknowledge that their sovereignty over these lands, skies and waters has never been ceded. I give thanks and pay my respects to Jagara and Turrbal elders, past, present and emerging for that ongoing commitment and the care that flows from it. I extend my acknowledgement um, to all First Nations peoples listening from country today. This is the second of the three All Apart forums. The focus on today's conversations is on communities and collaboration, 
which are intrinsic to art making for many artists in the Asia Pacific. Last week, we heard from both Vincente Diaz and Brian Fuata about the importance for them of Indigenous Pacific ideas of re relationality to, in the ways in which they're seeking to move away from the impacts of very limiting colonial binary ways of thinking about art and self. This session presents a range of models for community engagement, emerging modes of collaboration, assembly and exchange that amongst other things offer opportunities for change in current institutional models. Today, for example, my curatorial colleague, Ruha Fafika, instigator of the aptly named ACE project, will expand on the importance of relationality as well as processes of co-creation within a project she's led for APT10, which is engaged with members of the Southeast Queensland's local Pacific communities. But first, we hear from APT10 artists, Tita Selina and Erwan Ahmed, whose work, including that created for APT10, involves encounters with diverse communities with whom they interact and at times stage public interventions as they undertake long overland journeys. Please welcome Tita and Erwan. Hi everyone, welcome to the forum and we will start the share screen. Is it hard? Yeah. My name is Irwan Ahmed. My name is Tita Salina. Uh, hi, everyone. We both are living in Jakarta. So within this in presentation in 20 minutes, we tried to tell some others uh, our journeys. But to make it much easier, uh, we would like to make uh, two chapters. First chapter, uh, we call it tectonic dance. So, Indonesia is uh, located in the Pacific Rim and um, it's between the three tectonic plates. Uh, first is Indo-Australia, Pacific and Eurasia plates. So this um, tectonic plate, they have very um, different kind of movement and some are very active and some part it's quite stable. So uh, we get some information about this, uh, about how the they push each other through this graphic. So as you can see, the red and yellow red uh, uh, colors, that's considered the most, uh, how do you say, the, the, the fastest uh, movement uh, around, around the earth. So as you can see, the the south uh, uh, on on the bottom is the Indo Australia. So it's pushing under the Euro Eurasia plates. But, uh, that's on the left, and the Pacific plates is moved to the west side. So it is it's also uh, uh, how do you say like compressed to the to the 
Indo Australia and the Eurasia. Yeah, but the unique thing about this co coalition, yeah, uh, coalition tectonic because uh, they kind of swallow into the the earth, right? The, yes. the Australian plant mm -hmm. going down. Yeah. So under the Euro under the Euro Asia. So it's creates a specific kind of uh, geographic condition, for example, in Java. So basically, we are living on the top of volcanoes, a chain of volcanoes. Um, from the western part to the eastern part, it's like mostly we have a very active volcano. It's quite, uh, some of them are really active. And uh, the most interesting part for us is how we can also live and learn side by side with this potential natural disaster. So last year, I went to a Sumeru volcanic, erup volcanic eruption. It was such a, such a massive scale volcano, the highest in Java. So when this big mountain erupts, um, triggering many kind of uh, altruistic behavior from the people who support to 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 the to the victim mm -hmm. of the uh, eruption, and the sense of community also grows quite easily, and in a large scale, it's create like more solidarity support uh, to to help each other without any kind of government roles in it, um, and. To observe about this coalition, with coalition, coalition, uh, coalition yeah. between mm -hmm. these two plates, um, I think we can really a bit imagine how Java is looks like. It's almost like origami, when you push the pepper, mm -hmm. uh, and in the middle it creates a top of layers, the highest uh, top. Yeah. And to observe this, we went to the middle part of Java, uh, which is uh, mostly when the mountain, uh, high hills, and volcanoes were located. In, and surprisingly, in this area, it creates such, such, such specific condition because uh, after a millions or in the age of uh, geologic time, the river kind of open the sedimentation, the layers, the layers and open up so many information, uh, not about the uh, how uh, climate change happened many times in Java, but also um, the species before us, the extinct species. Uh, this is the piece of tools, but yeah. I would like to say this is the ability of uh, Homo erectus to create um, art, <laughs> because without any plan, they couldn't make it. But this is uh, specifically for the left-handed um, used and when I try to hold it is very it's it's feel much more comfortable than hold new iPhones it's just feel really fit in hands and in this area also we met some people who collect such a kind of um, artifact or the evidence of the long uh, community or or evolution process and it's from the paleolithicum which is a very rough uh, stone tools made from jasper. It's fairly hard uh, silica rocks or from until the Mesolithic um, and the empire period. Oh, sorry, uh, in the middle, it's like the early agriculture period and the empire period with Karis. Uh, but at the end, we also discover uh, a projectile, it could be from the war. So in this kind of uh, remains, guess. yeah, mm -hmm. remains, uh, I, I think I'm very fascinating what happened in Java. It's not only models for uh, how the civilization create themselves, but also how to understand how the earth moved. And, and the big question for us, little bit answer, uh, because what we are doing in Jakarta in the last three years. And within this, we would like to return to our chapter two, talking about Jakarta. Problems with a good person. 
maybe some of you have been to Jakarta before, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe who are not really familiar, Tita will give a little bit about um, short introduction about Jakarta. Yeah. yeah, so Jakarta, as you know, Jakarta is the capital of Indonesia and it is one of the most dense uh, populations in the world. So right now in 2021, the population is around 11 million uh, only in Jakarta province. And, um, and the, the size of Jakarta uh, for comparisons, it is about uh, to compare to Greater Sydney is Greater Sydney is 19 times bigger than Jakarta. So it's really dense uh, city. And the ethnicity, uh, because, because Jakarta before was, uh, was a coastal city and also a port cities, the majority, uh, the people who live there, uh, especially in the coastal is Javanese, uh, Bugis, Chinese, and Arabs. Right. Yeah. And the gates of Jakarta actually still in Australia. Yeah, Batavia, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so in the colonial, uh, in the colonialism uh, era, in the in the fifteen hundreds to eighteen hundreds, no, to nineteen hundreds, uh, Jakarta was named Batavia, and it was uh, the headquarter of uh, VOC, uh, the the multi company from uh, from from Europe. So uh, yeah, there is there is this story that uh, at that time uh, there is this uh, gate of Batavia was supposed to be sent to there to, to that city uh, with the with the giant ships, uh, but unfortunately it's never arrived because it gets sunk and there is like um, uh, frictions on the on the on the ships and most of the people killed uh, on the ships and now. Uh, uh, the gate, yeah, the, the, the Batavia gate now is located in Geraldton, Australia. Yeah, and I think uh, this is one of the example how Jakarta is struggling uh, because uh, it's very important for Indonesia as a centralized of the Nusantara or the archipelagos, like economy, politics, but also um, the power of identity. Jakarta, it's a very kind of a uh, magnet for almost everyone who want to change their life or to, to, to achieve something in their life or kind of Indonesian dreams. So, uh, uh, we conduct the walk actually along the coastline for along 40 kilometers. Uh, actually, this is initiated by Australian artists, uh, Hannah and Jorgen. Jorgen, but we continue this walk for almost every year. And uh, since, since the pandemic, we changed the strategy because we can walk, uh, it's quite risk to, to get in touch with people. Mainly during the walk, we meet, talk, and also uh, collecting so many information uh, about what happened and also record uh, digitally and bodily and stimulate our sensory uh, into the very specific condition, especially when the sign of something terrible happened in front of our eyes. So what, what we see uh, on the coastal uh, is quite catastrophic because of uh, very complex and very multi-layered uh, uh, issues, including the ecological issues. So uh, this, is, this is one of the sites that we visited is in Chilinching in Muara Baru, North Jakarta. And uh, it's full of uh, it's full of, of garbage, and we can see that uh, the the catastrophic that happening in Jakarta uh, is not only the, the the nature factor, but but I think we have assumptions that the human factors actually have the big uh, how do you say big impact impact yeah uh, uh, for this disaster, and this is one this is one of the samples actually. And uh, there is uh, one mosque, right, like very old mosque uh, in Chilinching area. It's called Masjid As Al Alam. So Alam means nature in Arab. So uh, and mother nature. Mother nature, yes. So uh, around three decades ago, as you can see, uh, the the red floor where I am sitting, uh, it 
was uh, the height is around 30 centimeter from the surface. So it's around 80s, like in the 1980s. But uh, now uh, it's 70 centimeter uh, under the surface. So, uh, so yeah, we, we can see that how rapid the, the land subsidence happening in the coastal. You know, one of the cause because of the uncontrolled uh, water, um, groundwater, groundwater ex extraction. extraction yes. yeah. And this has happened in the land, but uh, easily we could observe from uh, small archipelagos in the north part of Jakarta. So we call it Thousand Islands because it's like so many islands. And the size is also not too big, but they're facing uh, quite a serious threat by the rising of sea level and the same times the land subsidence and also the sand mining or the extraction of the natural resource around these archipelagos. So this is this is a uh, Nyamuk Besar Island. So uh, Nyamuk is mosquito. <laughs> Probably there are a lot of mosquitoes on the islands. So this is kind of like the remains uh, that's 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 still there. But probably in one decades, it probably uh, would be gone. And this is Nirwana Island. It's not too far from Nyamuk Island. Uh, Nirwana is kind of heaven, but it's, this island is completely going to happen right now. <laughs> It's already two meters below the sea level, below the sea, and uh, this cause um, one of the reason. It's probably because of the sand mining for to build the new port uh, nearby. So Tanjung Priok, Tanjung Priok yeah, yeah, one of the most important port for Jakarta, not only uh, for to other islands, but also the big gate uh, for the global world. Mm -hmm. And this is another island. It's a little bit far. It's going to the north. I think if you remember, uh, maybe one time took a flight before arrive at the airport, you will see like uh, some uh, different colors of the sea on the Jakarta Bay. And this one of them we can see from the uh, when we are landing, right? Mm -hmm. So we call it Ubi Island. Ubi Island. It's uh, in the sixties. Uh, this island it's become one place to execute uh, one political prisoner yeah, one political prisoner who wants to to declare uh, islamic country in indonesia but unfortunately the story about the climate refugees is already happened in the 1954 so the first uh, exodus moved because the I, the island is couldn't support uh, the normal life anymore due to the mosquito attacks and the severe abrasion. And to face this situation, there is so many plans. Uh, of course, this is the most popular one. And it's like in Japan also, this kept kind of similar how to face the tsunami, for example, by build the wall. So this is very expensive project. Uh, but also it's quite risky how we could separate people life, especially the fishermen community with the sea. The seawall built along the coast. So the height is about four two, meters. Yeah, four meters. Um, before the coastal line is privatized, so we cannot easily go into the sea, but within this um, seawall, even uh, makes complicated for people now to have uh, interaction with the ocean. And the idea to uh, choose more, let's say, environmental uh, friendly, it's not in, in the politician agenda, for example, to build uh, or to, to restore the mangroves or the wetlands. Uh, a long time ago, Jakarta is rich with the crocodiles, but now it's, we cannot see a crocodile. It's only garbage and plastic waste. And they try to, to, to plant a mangrove, but mangrove could that grow. It's amazingly, the plant is grow on plastic, but only maybe uh, for two or three meters. The mangrove cannot go grow much higher because the roots, it's not strong enough to hold to the sedimentation. They only hold to the plastic waste, which is very weak for them to grow. 
It's another thing, this is a very typical uh, community uh, situation. Uh, it's like the, the gap, uh, the racism gap, the capitalism gap, the economical gap, that's very um, yeah, striking me. For example, in the left, there is a kampung who stigmatize, uh, and, and the right side, it's a very kind of gated community with the super rich people live and on this island. So this is kind of one by side by side, but on a separate, very, very close to each other. Very close to each other. I mean, uh, in the long term, let's say, uh, if the rising sea level keep or keeping up, who will survive? I think gated community who lot lot of privilege easily they keep land higher and higher. But maybe for Kampung people, they have to deal with this terrible situation. For example, they have to keep build solidarity and the strategy to survive in the catastrophic. Yeah, yeah. there's also another situation uh, that the contaminated um, fish. fish and decreasing fish. Even in some area, uh, there is no fish. People have to change the, the, how they live by collecting the plastic and in the right side there is no fish uh, the mothers collecting the iron uh, from the old chips old chips yeah. so so uh, this so with this kind of, of findings uh, is it is it kind of like the signs of the dying planets so Natural factors such as the movement of tectonic plates are thought to have influenced the conditions of land subsidence in Jakarta, in addition to rising sea levels, which exacerbated the conditions. However, looking at the anthropocentric traces, we assume that human factors and developing failures are the main factors, such as poor groundwater management that causes economic inequality and worsens land subsidence. Was the policy carried out by a bad people? Maybe the answer is not always true, not always bad people. Policies that tend to have extraordinary destructive power are carried out by good people who may have always been the best students at school or believe they have done something noble and flawless. Thank you. Thank you. Ruth, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, thank you, Tita and Irwan. Um, amazing to see that footage and hear some of those stories as we 
move through our discussions today, I'm sure that we'll hear more about the role that art plays in bearing witness to the kinds of change, dra drastic changes that are happening um, in our world and um, the importance of, um, of um, the agency that's able to be provided to it um, to those communities that are affected. It might be a point that we can um, explore a bit further in the breakout rooms later. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Ruha Fafida, uh, curatorial assistant at the Gallery of Modern Art. Um, Ruha, the floor is yours. Sorry. Yes, firstly, just to, to Den Irwin, so lovely to hear about your work and the places and community you live in and care for. Um, and to everybody else, good afternoon and greetings. And in the languages of those cultures represented in our project team, Chingeri, Nisambula uh, Vinaka, Talo Falava, Kiora, Rananim, Halo Oketa, Daba Namona, Maloi Lele. It really is a privilege to be here and to be able to share in a very compact presentation a little bit more about the ECAPA Community Engagement Project, which I've had the bounty of being involved in since its inception around 2019. The, the ACE Project, which, it, which it's uh, affectionately known as, um, has been, was really a decisive step on the part of the gallery to further systematize and extend, build on the rich opportunities that we have to engage with communities uh, that live in and are from the Asia Pacific region um, as we expand our um, engagement with those places. And Kogoma has a commitment to being a leading institution for the contemporary art of Australia, Asia and the Pacific. And I think as a team, we hold this conviction that that has implications for how we involve, support and nurture Pacific practices, artists and communities. In Queensland, we are, uh, according to census data, we have the highest concentration of Pacifica peoples uh, compared to any other state in Australia and also are home to the fastest growing Pacific population in the country. And so we did have this, uh, initial focus for this project to really ask the question of what role does engagement with local Pacifica communities play and how can this be strengthened? And we recognize that APT itself as a, um, an ongoing event was a really rich arena in which to kind of accelerate this learning. So it emerged really out of a pilot project that um, we instigated in APT9, where we worked with the uh, Pacifica student associations from three universities that were had campuses in close proximity to the gallery and allowed for us to start a conversation and start building relationships with the young community leaders who really were engaged with a very broad cross section of the Pacifica community here in Queensland and um, showed an incredible generosity and um, an interest in engaging with us, helping us to identify the real opportunities for any uh, next steps that we would take to learn about this. Their, their involvement helped us to identify and clarify some project aims that have continued to guide ACE. So um, the aim to platform more Pacific voices and perspectives to maximize the contribution we're able to make to broader discourses and concerns of local community and to foster meaningful connections and interactions between artists and audiences um, and specifically the local Queensland community. The conversations we had through the pilot also shaped how we would work for these aims. So we were um, highlighted the need to really seek to understand and uphold Pacific values to engage Pacific audience in the project design as well as its impl implementation, to support um, occasions for artists and communities to connect directly to platform Pacific languages, to pilot partnerships with established uh, community groups with a long-term commitment to this place, uh, and to support community contributions on APT10 um, public platforms such as our website, publications, and other social media um, spaces. 
uh, in parallel to kind of challenging us to think more deeply about our relationships beyond the gallery, gallery our team really welcomed this opportunity to also reassess the relationships that we had uh, to each other within and how these could shift uh, to allow for you know, increasingly meaningful uh, community engagement. And part of that work was to identify uh, areas of learning that would drive our conversations, guide our conversations and our uh, conversations with others to really to pinpoint. Um, so we, we chose to explore out of this kind of emerged this exploration of you know, cultural safety, um, the spaces we create for learning, this idea of long-term engagement for public programs and the way that um, values guide our curatorial methods and practices. This learning, this kind of learning focus for the, it was a, quite a distinguishing uh, factor for our project and it allowed us to, to treat it, um, to come under the Australian Centre of Asian Pacific Art or ACAPA and to treat it as a, a project just like any other artist project for APT10 where the whole gallery could uh, rally support and we could start planning together very early on um, in the development of APT10. This learning mode was, um, was really important to us and we felt that it was important to also extend this to all community partners and participants that they could feel and be, feel welcome to be active protagonists of the learning process at the heart of the project. So to achieve this, oops, just try and go back, there we go. Um, we identified and selected a group of uh, dynamic and enthusiastic um, young Pacifica liaisons from our existing networks and connections. And uh, these individuals helped us to really liaise with the community partners that um, were doing a lot of the action behind the project. But most importantly, it gave emphasis. So they were behind facilitating reflection spaces with those people that planned um, planned engagements and also those that participated in the engagements and they chose to facilitate this in really culturally um, appropriate ways and think about how that documentation of learning and insights along the way could also be meaningfully captured and shared. Um, so this project team included them but it also included writers and content creators who at different points made contributions to the blog um, and to social media content to help extend this conversation to many others um, from the community. So at the heart of the doing of this project was um, our partnerships with community groups. And we focused on seven. Um, building the relationships with these groups was uh, behind that was really the intention to understand how working together could meaningfully contribute to their ongoing work. And this meant many conversations over a long period of time to understand their work, to allow them to um, get insight into the scope of APT and the work of the gallery, the many different facets of it. And out of that came seven, um, well, actually more than seven, they've continued to breed further ideas, but different activations and ways of bringing community and engaging communities sometimes very specific with the gallery. And um, as you can see from the first four that are mentioned there, this often also involved a very close collaboration with the artists um, of particular projects. We are unfinished, so there's still some activations to come, but to date we've estimated that over 200 members of the Southeast Queensland community have directly participated on site um, activations. And from that, uh, it's meant for over 70% their first time to Kagoma. Uh, and for over 85%, we've been able to estimate it made their first visits to an APT. Um, we, just to give you a very brief snapshot, I'm just going to show you some images of some of the different activations that have happened at the gallery, but we're going to focus on two just for the sake of time at the end and show you a couple of clips that give voice to those that were more deeply involved in those two activations members of our project team speaking to a couple in depth. So this was one attached to Kaporo Hamumu, um, which allowed us to learn about the relationship between Pacifica and Indigenous First Nations elders and the stories and role that food and the sharing of food play in carrying knowledge. Um, we are very fortunate to work with Pacific young people as well being networked in a diversity of ways. 
um, and really learn about the contribution that art and Pacific art can make to the discourse around mental health and well-being for young Pacifica people. This one you'll hear more about in a film, but it was engaging with a language school as well as a media group and uh, Brisbane Tongan community contributed to uh, the design and the making of works and several other public engagements since then. This one we'll also hear more about in a film uh, where we were learning about the role that Pacific community and the expertise that exist in community can um, contribute to also the making of work and how that, um, that work is acknowledged and welcomed to the gallery. We also had uh, the pleasure of working with the Pacific Climate Warriors and thinking about uh, how the exhibition could also contribute more to uh, discourses around climate justice in the region in creative ways. And uh, finally, working with Pacifica Women's Alliance, we actually have part of an activation happening tomorrow, which we're excited about. But this really highlighted for us um, different ways of thinking about generational learning and the use of language and the role of women in um, supporting artistic practices and learning in the community. I'm just going to stop share for a moment here and we'll watch two clips back to back um, about two of the activations. What's happening here today is um, an amalgamation of many months of organisation, um, not just from um, Rivers Team at Goma, but also um, from our Brisbane Tongan community in Selico and Tonga. They're basically putting together the Asian Pacific or the Tongan part of the um, exhibit. And one of the artists is Selica, so a team of artists from Tonga, who unfortunately, because of COVID, they're unable to be here with us. So Ruha and I um, got connected. We met up and organised the event today and also um, engaging the Tongan community to assist with the Selica collaboration in, um, in putting together their artwork. I'm here today just to, um, to help the, uh, the community uh, weaving all those, uh, those uh, coconut leaves. But I think it's very important because, um, you know, the younger generation, they don't know how to weave. And I think it's really important here because the older generation, they teach the, uh, the young one how to weave the, uh, the pola here. And, and, and we are very, very happy to see the young uh, the young kids are uh, keen to, to learn the, the trade of us uh, because we have been uh, back in Tonga. This is where we were brought up in the common family, you know. Uh, we don't have the uh, luxury of uh, of uh, European talent, but we were brought up in the kind of family using the, um, the local stuff here in Tonga to build a house uh, for, for the family. So, for me to see this uh, weaving today, it's really uh, bring back memories of, uh, of my um, uh, growing up in Tonga, you know, years back. And even today, I myself learned how to weave um, one of the, the walls or what was for part of the walls um, today. And, and, I, and that's special. That's special to me because I never got the benefit of learning that in Tonga. I'm so excited about it. I can't wait for that house to make sure it sits up there. That's it all down. Someone's head. But no, but I can't wait. Um, after meeting the two artists today, they were happy and they were happy to have me here as a community to support them. So it's a wonderful feeling. We're, we're truly honored. We're truly honored and I'm looking forward 
for um, exhibitions or for things like this to happen again to continue. And I, I understand um, that this is one of the first, and I hope it's not one of the last. Hi, listeners and participants of this forum. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share an excerpt from my piece uh, that I wrote for the ACE project. My name is Moale James and I am a Darwin-born Papua New Guinean woman with family ties to Central Province and the Motuan people. I belong to Gubba Gubba Village, which is an eastern coastal village in Papua New Guinea, and I currently live in Kalandarban and Ashgrove on tourable country in Mianjin and Brisbane. Uh, the piece I want to share with you today is one that I wrote with my colleague Osana Fatape, and we were exploring the ACE project and the learnings from that. So the piece is called Making Space. For the Australian Centre of Asia Pacific Art, the Pacifica Community Engagement Project, I wear multiple hats. I worked on Slotte Tuwale's APT10 project, which was installed as no location at GOMA as an ACE catalyst. Uh, and I was also a site build assistant, although the team jokingly called me the foreman. And initially the project was a self portrait of Salota's experiences as a Fijian Australian diaspora woman. But I would argue now that her Billy Billy actually reflects the histories and stories of the wider diaspora community. The warehouse where we built the Billy Billy was more than just a build site. It became a place of cultural safety for all participants, Pacific Islander or not. And this was a place of teaching and learning, a place where one's first language was prioritised and a place where all senses, sight, sound, smell, taste and touch differentiated from Western norms. And when I wrote this piece, I wanted to take people to the first day that I stood in that warehouse. And so I'm going to take you there now and I'd like you to imagine this. Uh, the warehouse holds multiple trolleys of bamboo stretching 20 metres in length down the room. Salote's request sings through my ears, bless the space for me. And I run my hands along the bamboo, announcing my presence, reassuring the stems that although I am not the artist, they are in safe and capable hands. There were admittedly anxieties from all parties not having Salote on site for the build due to COVID-19 travel restrictions. And I was concerned that her, vis her vision wouldn't be fully formed. And so prior to our build, I asked Salote how she would want the room to feel if she was there. What music should I play in the background? What food did she want participants to be fed? What tools should we use? And these questions frames the spirit of our relationship, not as a transactional exchange of services, but with an honest desire to support her vision in its entirety. This is the learning process at the heart of the ACE project to create spaces that design and deliver diverse experiences of engagement and to reflect and document that process in ways that contribute to an expanded vision of how art institutions can truly engage communities. I can think of moments in working on no location where the fruits of our intentions really came into bloom involving, would you believe it, um, a machete. Salote's request for this tool to clean the bamboo required various department signatures, but the instant we handed these machetes, which were tools community participants and builders like Suliasi and Jonah had been using since childhood, to our team was the moment that the gallery as an institution started relinquishing power. And I later found out that a master Billy Billy, Billy, Billy builder, Sevul, was called upon by Suliasi to make sure the installation was not only crafted the way it historically would have been, but also that it would indeed float. I once heard Ruha Fafita, Quagoma's curatorial assistant and ACE project coordinator say, perhaps an artwork isn't fully completed until it is viewed by an audience. 
And at our Brisbane Fijian community viewing, I saw faces light up with a sense of pride that a large scale installation representing their communities existed in an institution like Kudbaima. And I watched children from the Fijian community run up to the installation, hearing their elders tell stories about how these boats were used back home. No location had brought memories back to life. And this was the learnings of the ACE project. And the ACE project asks, how do we meaningfully engage community within the institution? And no location is a perfect case study. Through conversations with communities and their artists, we allow opportunities for the institutional way of doing things to adapt. And we allow our practice to evolve as histories and ways of living, being and belonging are too ever changing. And there is beauty and power in embracing language, food, music, and community as tools for change. Thank you for this opportunity. And I hope that you enjoyed learning a little bit more, not only about ACE, but uh, about the process of producing Slotte Tawala's work. Enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you, Smale and uh, members of the Brisbane Hong community. I wanted to acknowledge that uh, many members of our project team are with us in the audience today, and um, you may get to meet them in the breakout sessions towards the end um, and recognize their faces. Uh, just to further highlight of the ACE project as we move forward, um, was working with translators from the Pacific region. We were able to engage in several conversations about how these didactics were written and um, work with them to have 10 uh, languages um, used to translate over 60 didactics across the exhibition. It was the first time to do this uh, for APT. And, you know, in many Pacific proverbs, we speak about how the spirit of a, of a people is really held in that language. And it was uh, very heartwarming to see how even for those that didn't understand all of the text, seeing the diversity and breadth and um, recognizing um, often recognizing language in the institution, the power that they had um, in shaping their experience. Um, personally, something that I found uh, really valued about this project has been that the outcome of a learning project like this has gone far beyond the focus on diversifying, broadening audiences and participation. Uh, representation in gallery spaces. It's really generated shared experience that allows for collective understanding of different cultural frameworks um, to be built, how they can be applied in new contexts, and an appreciation for how different ways of thinking, of being, and doing can add value, not just for those communities that belong to these cultures, but for broader audiences and the societies that we uh, function within. Um, it's been exciting to learn about how willingness and commitment to kind of winning uh, our own framework beyond Eurocentric models um, can allow for organic institutional structural change to unfold in a way that allows for um, these qualitative and economic measures of growth to be tempered by a deepening relevance and an increased capacity to be a force for positive social change in service of an increasingly diverse uh, community. Yeah. In a recent reflection space, um, one of our catalysts, Irie Chow, brought to mind this quote, that true leadership is dedicating your life to weaving a fala or a mat that you'll never live to lay on, but being knowing your children will. And we no doubt have seen the value in um, acknowledging that the work of learning to strengthen, but also to reconceptual reconceptualize our relationships with community is one that requires consistent and systematic effort over a long period of time. So uh, much like the weaving of a mat that will last many generations. So I'd like to end just by um, sharing with you a poem that Osana Fa'ata'ape, another project team member wrote about this project. Um, and I'll stop sharing so that she can do that. But I'll say malo apito and thank you from here and leave you with um, the voice of Osana. If I can. Talo for lover, my name is Osana Fa'ata'ape and today I'll be reading you a poem that I wrote for the Artlines magazine called Te Oleva. 
a basket of possibility woven by institution and community, resourceful and abundant, convention meets curiosity, method meets malleability, framework meets fluidity. The deeper the roots, the sweeter the fruits, anchored in connection, cultivated through Talanoa, nourished by deep reflection, strengthened through Fa'asua. Venturing into unknown produces fertile ground for seeds to be sown, away from home, in the land of milk and honey, our nil tastes different. Expression evolving as we change whilst our values remain the same. Like our ancestors, we traverse vast waters, adapting to the rhythm of the shifting tides, drawing upon our ways of being, moving, tasting, hearing, feeling, our mother tongue keeping alive the ties to home. As we mark our tapa, as we build our waka, as we sing our wayata, as we feed our manava, as we speak our ngangana, we honour our whakapapa, we cultivate mana, we tell leva. Drawing upon our abilities, we reshape the possibilities. Na tōrodo, na takudodo, ka orai te iwi. People of the most biodiverse sea, hues of colour not found on the wheel, our oceans ebb and flow, washing up treasure and pearls. Reflect on how the light hits, how the flavours enrich, an oeuvre of possibility observed for the cycle to begin again. Thank you and the whakatai lava. Thank you, Asana and Moale and Ruha. Um, what an amazing journey you have taken us on during APT. I think that we will um, move straight into the panel now. We're running a little bit behind time. Um, so I'd like to um, start by um, introducing our panellists. I'm joined today by four esteemed collaborators, all who have been involved in APT in one way or another. From Lahore in Pakistan, we have artist, writer, art historian and teacher, Farida Batul, one of our APT 10 interlocutors. Joining Farida are three collaborators of APT 10 projects, Salma Jamal Musham and Kamruzaman Shadin, who will speak to the work of Gidri Borley Foundation of Arts, the organisation that they founded in the northwest of Bangladesh in 2001 to develop pathways for cultural and artistic exchange. Vicky Lenahan, a multimedia artist, educator and museum professional, who's part of the team working on the Naitahu Focus Kapura Ohamamu um, project and also is part of the collective Paimanu from Aotearoa um, in New, New Zealand. Lastly, Tavita Latau, the founder and lead artist of the inspiring Selika International Art Society in Initiative, whose fale you saw in Ruha's presentation, based in Havaloto, Oloto, Tonga. Um, what a group. Uh, Sharina and Mushum, um, it would be good to begin with Gidri Borley's Foundation of Arts. I understand that the seeds for the foundation were planted with community engagement work that Shadi and you were undertaking in your home village um, as part of your studies with the fine arts faculty. Can you tell us about your motivations for formalising this foundation? What outcomes were you hoping for? Thank you. Um, I I'm born and brought up in our village. It's called Thakurgao, North Bengal, Bangladesh. And in my childhood, I used to work and play with the community. Then when I came to further studies in Dhaka University, after then I realized that my root is so important. And all the time I want to go back the root. When the collective communities of all the time is there, 
in the in our community they lots of different communities that are there and they have nice and fine collectives but i thought that firstly i want to work with them and make some festivals there then somehow that we realize that we want to work more creatively about want to collaborate with art and the other communities work then we found the gidriwali it's like that it's growing it's not that i am deciding that we i want to make a organization it's like that we need a organization then we can collaborate both of them that's how it works organic than uh, formal so uh, it, the process is ongoing so what it's, it's very organic we're growing every day and we're planning new things every day and it's like you know changing shapes and changing thoughts uh, through exchanges within ourselves within uh, from uh, with people from the outside who are coming in, in in the village to stay with us so yeah so and um, we have, uh, I mean, uh, it's a foundation in name because we had to register it with your, uh, with the government. But um, we call ourselves a village creative collective, not exactly a form within a formal structure. So <laughs> because it's always changing, always changing, and always growing. Uh, you're on mute. Sorry, it was. <laughs> Vicky, you work across multiple platforms as an artist, an educator in the context of museums and for your local council. I first learnt about your work through Paimanu, the Naitahu artist collective that you're part of, and about whom you penned a beautiful text for the gallery's Asia Pacific Art Papers. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this collective and particularly the ways in which it really blasting a trail for decolonial practices in museums. Kia ora Ruth, tēnā rā tata katoa, I want to acknowledge the presence of everybody in this space, past, present and future, especially my esteemed colleagues. Yes, Pai Manu's mission is to express Ngāi Tahutaka, so that, that is the beingness of our iwi, which is our bones, our, our, our tribal entity. Um, as a collective people, we function as a collective. We, li we, we live in the space where we share bloodlines, share stories, and Paimanu within that, this tiny little group of people within a broader, like around 70,000 people, uh, with the largest... Um, We've got the largest island in the entire Pacific Ocean. Um, that pretty much all of it is our jurisdiction. So we, our stories have grown up in a large space across a very large ocean um, over many, many thousands of years of our journey to be here. But Paimanu is talking about our time in this space in a very modern kind of way, uh, we're all graduates of studio in Atelier art schools, and um, that's a very narrow bandwidth through which we communicate our, our visual identity. So um, we're drawing on a many millennia of um, mark making and um, storytelling and performance making, but Paimanu is a collective. We, we focus on expressing this massive history and this shared identity through this uh, medium of contemporary visual art. So you can see that um, in, expressed in very many ways, you know, um, 2D, 3D, 4D, 5D maybe, whatever that might be. Yeah. And it's a real privilege to work with my Bonoka, with my cousins, um, constantly bouncing back ideas and, and concepts, um, but not just amongst ourselves too. We're always checking in with the broader community. We're always checking in with the non-artists, if that's a thing, because 
we genuinely believe that we're all artists. We've all inherited this capability to express ourselves in these ways. It's just so happens that this group of us have been to art school. You know, we've we've um, jumped fully into the academy and um, actually so many of us have popped out the other side as teachers within the academy too. I mean, right, right up to um, our, our elder within our collective is an emeritus professor who has been a, um, a head of school. So yeah, and we're working, working with our ancestral stories but also operating within this colonial space. So um, we actually think of ourselves as re-indigenizing rather than decolonizing because um, I'm sunburnt and that's happened because I've got colonial ancestry. Um, we, we can't separate ourselves from the colonial story that's very much a part of us so yeah yes. Um, it's a very exciting time too because uh, Aotearoa New Zealand is moving very carefully into a new space of accepting that we can't decolonize we can never remove that part of our story and neither should we we're not going to smash down the statues we need to remember those stories in fact there's so many stories that have been glossed over that we're working really hard to bring back to the fore that yeah it's it's a real privilege to re-indigenize the space to bring these stories back with all of us not not just those of us who <laughs> have learned how to paint. <laughs> hmm. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Thank you. Farida, um, as a member of the Awami Art Collective seek seeking to install in public spaces, you've recently been working on a community engagement project in an urban colonial part of Nahor, whose demography has changed quite a lot in the past two decades. Can you tell us a little bit about that project um, and your motivations for undertaking it using collaborative process? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking me. Um, yeah, uh, we have been working as collective in uh, addressing different aspects of cultural identity and also how uh, violence has been shaping our uh, past history, which has not been um, recognized uh, in an, on a collective level. So, uh, but uh, this time I really wanted to, uh, it was my own individual project and I wanted to address a colonial building, but it was built by, uh, on a mall road, which is very close to the place where I work, which is National College of Arts. And it's the Mall Road is the central uh, road built by uh, the British Raj. And there is a building uh, called the Al Singh Mansion, which was built by a very rich philanthropist, um, Sikh uh, resident of Lahore in 1930s, who left after partition. And he gave a lot of uh, colleges, university, um, and buildings and other things to the city. So this building is a part of Vacu Trust and is being taken care of. And many people have rented um, little, little shops and restaurant places. So my interest in this particular project was because in 2006, uh, one of the portion of this building was uh, rented by a restaurant, uh, Shazan. And uh, they were attacked. Uh, the whole Mall Road was attacked by religious mob because they were protesting on the publication of blasphemous cartoons by Danish uh, newspaper. Uh, so I failed to understand why the mob turned towards their own uh, property and their own uh, play, uh, people's uh, possessions. And they set this building on fire primarily because the restaurant in the populist imagination was owned by a group of minorities who uh, they condemn uh, a lot in Pakistan and they are very marginalized. So uh, they are already in a, on a verge of you know, extinction and they are not supported uh, largely. So since 2006, this place was closed and it was shut down and I was photographing it since then, you know, the, from the day it was set on fire, I went there. 
I was documenting the whole Mal Road because Lahore and that part of city has been my center of uh, attention for my research and my other interest. So when I was asked to do something about legacy of Lahore, so I thought, okay, this time I really needed to mobilize the community in order to give some sense of solidarity uh, to the community, uh, which is already marginalized by and through creative means and by involving people from other marginalized communities, like people from lesser recognized creative practices. Uh, so all those practitioners, we all work together uh, to set up an exhibition over there in order to bring people back to a place where they had a lot of memories since 1940s and 50s, people who used to go there. So, uh, so it was a very uh, interesting and collaborative project and primarily it was successful uh, because of the people support who were resident around that area. And just because I approached them and I told them about the project that we are going to open this place only for four days, only, uh, that was the duration of the exhibition. Uh, but that thing triggered a lot of you know uh, help and support and motivation from the people and they said don't worry we are so happy about you know this place to be opening up and uh, opening for um, our memories and for our collective um, histories so for me uh, on one level this project became very important because since the day i was photographing the building, it was set on fire and was de de destroyed completely uh, to restoring my faith again in the people of the city that, you know, these are the, the old the citizen and resident of the city are not intolerant in that sense. And they really wanted to uh, uh, embrace their own heritage, their own uh, culture, their own buildings. And they were really uh, ready to fight all kinds of, you know, uh, radical elements, uh, negative elements, which are uh, really uh, capturing that urban space. So uh, what I did was, uh, other than using projections uh, and text from different literature, I also asked um, cinema board painters to do some cutouts of film heroines the way they used to do and heroes uh, of the some major uh, moments in Pakistani cinema. And also they did some murals on the outside of you know, the building uh, in the corridors. Uh, and on the day of the exhibition, the, all these practitioners were still working on their murals so that people would see them live on uh, working on the, those pieces. Uh, cinema and their practices were also very much part of this area because uh, Lahore at some point in 1920s or later, uh, a very major center of uh, film distribution for even for Tamil films and others because uh, for the North India. So uh, these buildings, upper halls used to be uh, their rehearsal rooms for dances. And so so they, this is very, you know, closely linked with the cinema. And the cinema industry is really uh, not the same anymore. And for many reasons, and the, the painting with hands uh, of the cinema board has also been changed. And now the digital technologies, the flex has, uh, uh, has been replaced. The other thing which I used was uh, local uh, calligraphers, people who uh, are used to decorate and name the holdings and boards of the shops of all the shops of the same area. So I invited them and I said, okay, I want to work with people who have decorated the shops fronts of Mal Road. So there were three people who came and so uh, we all worked together. We collected the text which describes the best about the city, why the city is so important, you know, the conditions and all of that stuff. So we created uh, a kind of um, uh, a textual wall uh, on the side of the building. So for people, you know, to while they are going through that, so they can read about, you know, what different artists and writers have written about. 
So on the uh, on the front shutter of the shop, I included all the names of the artists and it may look very odd for this forum, but you know, for Pakistani uh, conditions, to include the name of all those practitioners, creative practitioners and artists as artists, you know, with me mm -hmm. uh, under one category was a big thing uh, because they were shocked to see that they were not educated from the university or any institution and they are not provide, uh, they are not recognized uh, as cre creative practitioners. So on the day of the opening, they asked me, even though I, <laughs> explained everything and worked very deeply with them. They said, uh, are we allowed to enter the exhibition? So that statement reflected a lot about, you know, how uh, the community engagement is uh, needed in our part of the world because the artists are very uh, important and they are doing great jobs, but this link with the community is still lacking uh, in many ways. So, so I tell everyone this statement, you know, that even though their names were was written on, on the front, so they really needed to feel confident to feel like that they are the art, artists in this project. So of course, you know, um, um, in those four days, they were given platforms, they were interviewed, they met many people. So, people who came to visit the city were really engaging with the legacy of the Lahore and how the old part was being revived. And I hope that after this exhibition is now is finished, uh, the, the people who own this restaurant feel the strength again to start it because they are still paying the rent and they are keeping the property, but they have not the courage to open it up. So, so that was the project. And I thought that it was very important to involve the community which is living next to it to come forward to give so, this feeling of solidarity and strength. Thank you. Sounds like an amazing project and like um, very, very um, change, like uh, meaningful for many of the participants, not just the owners of the restaurant, the artists as well. Tavita, painting, particularly the way that it's taught in Western art schools is a fairly individualist pursuit. You were trained in Australia and returned to Tonga to create a practice there. You quite quickly became the founder of an art society. I was wondering if you can share a little bit about how Felica began and what it seeks to do. Oh, you might be on mute. No? Hello? Yeah, that's better. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, yes, I I had come back after education. Uh, I, I, I started off my career being, I worked as an individual artist uh, just from home and I taught for a little while. After six years, uh, it was uh, until 2008, that's when I decided to, uh, I knew I had to, to offer something to, 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 to share what I, I have with, uh, with somebody else, meaning if you have a group of people or a couple of people or a, a somebody. So, uh, I, and I didn't know how it was going to come about, but I met a friend, we made some cover, drink cover for a couple of nights, few nights and just in the bush next door to my house, uh, opposite the, the lagoon. And that, uh, and that took off from there. Uh, uh, I think uh, we, we had no intent, I had no intention of who to, to, to summon to come into the, to the uh, to this environment that we were brewing here. Uh, we were just at the younger years. We were recruiting just young people. It just happened so that many of the young people that was attracted into the group were just runaways and uh, people who didn't like school so much. So we ended up uh, uh, collecting stuff, selling stuff to, to fundraise to, to build a little uh, tongue and file. The, the first, the original tongue and file we had. Yes, and, uh, and that was our shelter. 
but before that, we had worked under just under the stars. It rained sometimes and it was cold. Um, so we had uh, extension wire from the house for electricity, for power. So, but it built up from there. Uh, it went from two to two people to 15 kids. And, and so I was happy to, at that time, I, I, I was self-supplied. I had to sacrifice and give up a lot of things that I like to just provide art material for everybody. Um, and but it was mostly young uh, at that time. It was only mostly boys. Um, girls uh, in Tonga, uh, families reserved their their girls for uh, for a, a rather a feminine job, so not, not so much painting. So unless so, but we in the future years, later years, we had girls at the runaways. They ended up finding refuge in us, so we were able to teach them. So it was only um, we threw the, the girls that um, separated themselves from homes. So and, and, and the number grew from there. Um, I taught them art, um, mostly just focusing on uh, fine arts only. And um, it wasn't until years later that we were able to be uh, helped financially from the government of Tonga, and then uh, from the um, New Zealand government, I think, on the Australian government, yes, um, in the later years. So I was really happy for that. And and, and I, I told these kids with the intention to, because I knew maybe they didn't have much for them uh, lay ahead of their life. Uh, I mean, they were still young. Uh, you know, they were not focused and not, nothing paid. Pay, uh, really meant you know, a great importance to them. You know, it, they, were, they were just a bunch of young people um, you know, rolling around. And so I really sat them down with talk and um, I gave them the best advice I could and then also taught them how to paint also. And uh, so slowly through the years, some have uh, hung on to the to programs. Most, some have moved on. They, the work overseas, some get married, some pass away, uh, move back to the islands. But uh, I'm, I'm still thankfully that there are some uh, some young people, well, they're not so young anymore now, but it's been uh, 14 years, and they're still with us, uh, especially uh, Daniela Pedillo, who had uh, exhibited with me in uh, Kakoma. Yes, and then he's, a, he's an, a, a good uh, evidence of uh, the kids who had hung around and kept the promises because I really had to work with him. And he had said, uh, I think from, from day one, he seemed so serious about the, because he was a mechanic, uh, Daniela, he'd left school. He drank kawa, uh, there's a kawa house right across my house. And I'd seen him there, didn't know him that much. Um, but he was, yeah, he was a guitar player there. And um, he was a mechanic at the time. So this happened so he dropped me one time. He'd seen me and his, his sketch with the, the kids. And so he came and he tried a little bit. Uh, so he left, came back a few times more and, you know, and suddenly he could discover that he was interested in, in it a lot and, and he could do it really well. You know, he, and I, yeah. And so I, 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 I sat him down to encourage him a lot. He didn't cover less and, and pick up art as a, you know, maybe as a profession, you know, and just, and, you know, so that's how people came in, I mean, different ways. People were there, young people invited their friends, they came over because they liked the music, or they heard that we drink cover from a, a toilet bowl. Uh, for various reasons of young people came in, came in, so, and we made that, we made sure that the house was, that the walls were covered in graffiti, and all the graffiti were our names on the wall. Uh, now, just it made it a, a youth friendly environment. Uh, and so, uh, and uh, the funny thing was, we had, and in Tonga at that time, our little Tongan Fale would have been the only existing Tongan Fale on the main island. So, we were really proud of that we were the only, and so a bunch of kids with the only Tongan Fale, but with a lot of heavy metal music inside it electronic music played inside the tongue party, which is our next one neighbor says she met European house, they played traditional tongue and music in there. So we were there just the complete contrast of that. And 
uh, and we like the idea to uh, you know and and also and it matched the my intention also because i wanted to bring uh more than arts into the uh, to the plate and had to be it had to feed them slowly with that um of course i came i, I came from sydney i, I, I knew of banksy the street graffiti um artist and and you know numerous other uh, artists and creators and so i had to really just present them with books and magazines that showed them slowly into the art world and uh, and finally getting a hold of documentaries introducing them to um, you know, documentaries about the various artists and their creation story you know and before you know they all loved it yeah. so and uh, that's how I, I think i was able to just to teach them i would teach them some like uh I did not want to teach them the way I was being taught uh, at a normal school, a, a traditional uh, art school, where where there were the protocols follow. I let them, um, I let them experiment, and then they would each pursue their own, and I would never ever dare tell them what to paint, because I knew already they had left home because they did not want to be told to do anything. So I kept the idea that I always should let them on their own and just guide them, just guide them alongside, but never really tell them what to do. So that's another way of keeping them interested in their own work so that they could, they don't want to be dominated by somebody else. Uh, yeah, so, like uh, and that's how it was, yeah. Sounds like it was quite an organic kind of yeah. um, was, development in the same way as Gidri Borley. Um, I, I, I love that you, um, in the Fale that you have recreated of the studio, that you have both the Carver Bowl and also the library um, yeah. together um, with equal footing in that um, kind of balancing of um, different ways of thinking about making art. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, our, our, our books, of our library, our art books is always something I take pride in. Mm -hmm. I I always want to make sure that there are books around the seven people all the time. Okay. Uh, when we first built our second party here in my house, that there was something that was really it had to play a big role where the stack of books will be safe from the rain and and you know extra um, etc. And mm -hmm. hmm, because I knew that a source of their education came from the books. I mean, we we're talking about before this is before the smartphones yeah so yeah and so really and they, they have not heard or, or seen anything about these uh, artists and these books so uh I, th I think it was for me to break it down to them and show them explain to them what worked uh, what by picasso and uh dali and all that so yes and and i was really happy um especially the later years they, they 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 start to expand their mind and they appreciate work from from outside. Uh, so a, a, the troubling thing is with an island, small place like Tonga, what we see when we grow up here, and the, the traditional art here is especially it's only done with pencils and real, a realistic sketching of whatever, and so mm -hmm. that's our only concept of what art is and should be. So I want to brought these. Uh, yeah, it was a course of nothing matter because they see it as a yeah to work of a, a demented mind or you know of, of an uh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, possessed mind that what color should throw around a floor everywhere and making a mess and chaos. But uh, I think over years of having to explain to them. Uh, so, but then yes, uh, and I want to keep that's also. I mean, there are people, they, they know, we, they know uh, our traditional art, uh, our traditional art as, as we grow up. Uh, I think they've already had a taste for it and they, they've experienced it. Uh, from, from, from the point, moment on that we had met, from that point on, I always want to make sure that they, uh, I, I, lead, um, I give them a, a different light to, to see and understand art in a, way, in, in a different mind. Yeah. yeah. And that's how we, we take it out to the school for um, so six, seven years now. We're taking it out to the primary schools and the, yeah, 
what I taught these kids in my studio, that's what we're teaching these kids in the outer islands and on the main islands. Exactly the same thing with the kids that I taught from the beginning. And yeah. I also taught them slowly to become teachers of teachers. arts. Yeah, yeah. So they can help me to teach a, a large number of people from, yeah. So, and we also teach that style, that uh, way of mixing colors and thinking of concepts that are not uh, actually taught in school. This art here has just been um, in implemented in, uh, in, uh, in the primary and art in high school, in primary school. Uh, but I think they they they, they, they keep to a very a structure, a uh, uh, very um, a set way of thinking, which I believe art should not be taught that way. And yeah, so they learned that from their classroom, and now we come we come as our team and teach them another light, another facade of art, or what yeah. art is. You know? yeah. And not saying that the other other one is wrong. They are just coexisting. With, well for them yeah. Yeah. and that, that's just gonna that's what we seek to do and hopefully we raise a, a team of army of artists in the future <laughs> and better army artists, artists. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah artists and, yeah, and hopefully better way better artists than myself than ourselves that's great. You know? yeah Thank um farida you are a teacher as well um universities have been really crucial for developing artists careers and lahore how important is teaching and mentoring and growing and supporting the arts community there? Like what role is it playing? Uh, yes, the universities are very important uh, uh, for community development uh, and artist community development. Because you see, these are not commercial um, places and they don't have any other uh, like galleries uh, in Lahore. Uh, they have their own interest, whereas uh, universities have very scholarly and academic interest in developing these artists. And I, I think in, in our uh, place, like in NCA, there are many options like uh, which we are helping, which are created to help artists uh, across uh, the region to come here and work with us and enjoy the resources and enjoy the experience of the city, like artist residencies are there. Uh, then we have this whole tendency of uh, incorporating our projects with our peers or with our fellow students, or with, with our students or fellow artists. Uh, for example, in my projects, I uh, always use uh, students to you know, come there and do the talks and do the, uh, kind of a research projects, you know, along with me so that, you know, they are uh, working side by side and they are also learning uh, this, the essence of, you know, working in the community, how mm -hmm. the uh, artist communities are operating and how they see the world and how uh, they look at the culture and society around. For instance, in this project, which I mentioned, uh, I took uh, all the foundation year students, which are about 300, and we did one week long uh, exercise of talks and some research. And I, I gave them this assignment that I'm not going to tell you all the reasons why the buildings were burned. So you have to find out yourself, you know, and connect with the community. So, so the whole idea, you know, when they were bringing back their responses and they were interacting with people, so the whole idea was to, you know, uh, that this generation will also will learn how to start engaging with people around them, you know, and how to research and how to make connections and how to feel for uh, the place where they are living, you know, so not just pass through it, uh, but to actually feel it. And uh, so, and there's another thing which I'm doing at the moment, which in which I'm asking them to do their individual research for a collaboration uh, which I'm doing as a private project. It is for virtual museum and uh, to do uh, little, little projects for women movement in Pakistan. So all of them are bringing a lot of interesting inputs uh, like public transport and how the experience of 
going from one mode of transport to the other and the public space and how the women are experiencing both from male experience and female experience. So, so there are some of very interesting things which are evolving. So I think universities are very important in, uh, in helping uh, shape ideas in providing platforms and generating new uh, projects and new things for artists, communities. And uh, because when they are in the market, uh, it is driven by other uh, motives and other things. Um, Vicky, the APT10 project that you're a collaborator on, Ka Purora Ohamomu, brings together practitioners of many disciplines from archaeology to the visual arts. Significantly, it also engage, actively engages with Naitahu elders and community members. Can you share a story about the work that you've undertaken with your um, community around the Taonga or the middle materials that form the heart of this project? and how rich or challenging, or both, <laughs> this experience has been. Kia ora, Ruth. Um, you've described the situation that I encounter with all of the collective projects that I'm involved in, Kai Manu, um, uh, the coastal flows, um, that Alex Monteith leads out with um, her amazing logistics abilities and beautiful photography. Um, they all center around connections and storytelling and, um, and a really crucial part of uh, our culture of elders sharing their knowledge with uh, emerging practitioners. Um, mentor menteeship kind of scenario and uh it, it's not necessarily um confined to within a discipline um like you would see in the academy where the professor teaches the student it's broader than that and we get to see that and we get to experience that because like i say we're all um moving through both worlds at once and my generation um, born in the late 60s and early 70s where we're uh, in my family the second generation but in many families the first generation to go through tertiary education and uh, our children will go on to be you know quite commonly um, postgraduate educated just because because they can um, it, you know, it, it, it's interesting for them. Aside from that, our, our children's generation is um, experiencing a return to our tribal areas too, where, where um, there's less of a distinction between the city kids and the country kids. So we, we had an, a diaspora within our own country in the 1950s and 1960s where my parents' generation um, were born in the country on tribal land and then moved to the city. We saw this across the whole world with um, the post-industrialization that happened after the Second World War, where factories just popped up everywhere. And it was the, um, the minority communities that populated the, the workforce of these communities. So, and I mean, everywhere, right back to Mother England, where it was the, the you know, the working class that did the work. So one thing that we're seeing is that our children and my generation and um, some of my age group, my grandparents now too, but you know, the babies in the arms as well, that we're, we're all sharing on this journey of storytelling together and we're hearing from the elders, from the great grandparents all the time. And sometimes our elders are politicians and sometimes they are professors and sometimes they're ditch diggers, but they've all got fantastic stories to tell. And this um, recognition of everybody's got a story to tell and we need to hear from everybody is um, really active in this project that Alex is leading out. And um, you've got, <laughs> I'm so jealous because we can't come to um, the engine Brisbane to experience that part of the exhibition but you you've seen that as our elders have met um 
country elders on country and, and they've shared a meal together and they've shared stories and that's become part of APT10 that all of these stories are being shared. So that, that's what, that's how we function. And that, that's the really exciting part of this journey for me, particularly as a museum professional, because that's what I've been doing all this time is sharing all of these stories of these interdisciplinary kind of experiences and reading people's body language and figuring out if they want to be approached to hear what that, that, uh, this is a really difficult thing to describe for me because we don't own things and we don't think of objects or artifacts as things. We think of them as treasures. So I'm going to refer to all the things that are in museum collections as treasures and the mother or the grandfather um, of them all. The British Museum is a, a fantastic example of, no, I own that, you can't have that. Whereas we see them as um, temporary guardians or something that they really need to return to us. That This is the space that we're working in with Alex's project. So um, Kagoma and every other museum that we've worked in, every other gallery that we've worked in in this space, we, we are, again, we're re-indigenizing this space with these stories. And we're not just doing it with our own tribe. We're doing it with our, um, mm -hmm. our collaborators like Alex, who's just awesome. <laughs> um, brings her own story of being, you know, the descendant of, of a colonized people and the Irish were smashed by the English. Um, yeah, so... We're learning from our elders all the time. And I, I'm so grateful because there've been moments where I've really needed the elders right there with me because I'm spiritually not able to carry this particular phase of the project through without them being right there. Like it's been so challenging what we've been uncovering through these uh, the inventory process of the, 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 the assemblage that has come out of our ancestral um, food gathering territories that uh, I've, I've, I've had the wherewithal and the maturity to say stop work and let's go and find Uncle Michael and then Uncle Michael's come in and he's, he has said the right words. He's communicated with the ancestors and um, calmed the space down again but you know when 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 you come across in an art project where I'm challenging the archaeological worldview because the archaeologist grave robbed mm -hmm. and then appeased his ego by writing this PhD um, and that's an incredibly um, incendiary thing to say, but the academy is all about the individual's ego. And that's okay, that's what it is. Um, but random pieces of my ancestors' bones, just randomly in a box, it was an incredibly challenging experience for me. So, But also on the flip side of that, working in this, this space with this assemblage, I'm... Um, sifting through dirt and dirt to us is the, the word is whenua and whenua also means placenta because it's our connection to our ancestors in a very physical way um, and I'm, I'm just so honoured to be able to do that to be treasuring the remains of my ancestors at the microscopic level their DNA is around me all the time um, I'm not ashamed to be teased by the archaeologists on the team because it, the photograph has to be just right. You know, it not only needs to contain the information for the future uh, archaeological researcher, but also for the future artistic researchers. It needs to look good. And I know that's an entirely individual assessment, but you know, it's fun. It's banter. I learn a lot from the archaeologists. I can tell the difference between a pipi and a tuaki now, two different kinds of shellfish that are almost identical. Almost. But now I can see the difference. Now I can see the difference between this type of uh, plant material and that type of plant material now, but you know, the one what we've uh, what we're seeing in the ropes. Yeah, I'm 
like I say, every single project that I'm involved in that uh, where we're expressing our tribal identity, we always communicate with as many people as we can. You know, the, what feather is this? So we'll ask a side, an ornithologist, what bird is it? But we'll also ask a weaver because actually the weaver will know quicker yeah. because they're working with these feathers all the time. They're beautiful stories and I do encourage people on Fridays um, if you check out the Quagoma website to engage in the inventorying process with Vicky um, Please do each, join us. each Friday. Um, I did want to ask another question from um, Gigi Borley from Mushum and Shardin. Um, it does look like we're running out of time but quickly can you just share with us a little bit about the, pro the project that you have in um, APT10 um, and the, um, the, the stories that inspired it, Bible Estate, um, um, and the way that village participants um, were part of that process of designing that project. And, uh, like Vicky said, uh, uh, it's all about storytelling. So uh, our process involves a lot of sharing of stories and how each of the uh, community members have come into the village to trace back into their histories. And uh, some of the, a particular community is, uh, uh, has a history of uh, migration during the colonial times uh, because they came from Assam during the partition of uh, Indian subcontinent. Uh, I mean, during the time when the British left and uh, so we explored that story and also how they brought the, the, the jute hanger uh, thing that, uh, that is part of the installation. So, so that, that's their cultural element, which came to the village with them because uh, in, in, the, uh, in our particular village, there was uh, this, this thing, uh, shika we call it, Shika was not part of the uh, you know, weaving technique in uh, our village, but this community brought it with them. So it was used to hang uh, food, to keep, it, uh, keep food out of uh, children or cats or dogs and hanging from the ceiling. So, uh, so we explored that story and how railways are connected, how colonial migration is connected, how jute plantation is connected. It, it, it was a fascinating uh, you know, uh, discovery of a lot of historical threads which was put together. Mm -hmm. And uh, Shadin came up with the idea of you know, uh, making large scale shikas and uh, the idea of pots came later, but uh, 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 10 to 12 community uh, women who are excellent in uh, weaving this shika, they uh, collaborated with Shadin yeah. and uh, created the installation. And uh, what Kidribauli always does is but when we make something together, we, we put it up in the village first. So installed it in, in the village. Uh, so the installation was there and there were uh, singing and celebration and a feast. So we, <laughs> it was the process, the whole process lasted, I think for three years and it was amazing. Wow, three years. I love that it was installed in the village first. Um, <laughs> and it sounds like there's great stories that were part of the work. I think um, that we have come to the end of the time allotted for the panel, sadly, but I know that all of the speakers are able to join in the breakout rooms that we have a short period to move into now. So I do encourage people to stay um, and to share, to, um, to engage in conversation around some of the points that have come up today. It would be great to hear what the things that have that these conversations have triggered for you. Um, yeah, so thank you all. Um, let's move into the breakout rooms now. There will be guidelines in the chat that you can follow. Um, so yeah, see you all soon. I just would like to um, thank you all very much um, for your generosity in joining us today. And, 
Also to thank um, the bursary recipients who are joining us for all three sessions. So thank you so much. Most importantly, thank you uh, from the bottom of our hearts to all of the presenters today, Tita, Tita and Irvan, Ruha and members of the ACAPA, and our panelists, uh, Farida, Musham, Shadin, Tavita and Vicky. I think we were all very touched by um, the notions of community in which you engage um, in your everyday practice and as artists and facilitators, thank you so much. Um, thank you to all our partners who are making this series all apart, APT10 Professional Engagement Forums happen. Obviously, Quag Goma, thank you so much, and the team behind APT10, including Westspace and the Griffith Asia Centre. Um, our team, our AsiaLink Arts, uh, Jala Adolphus, who's been so instrumental to the success of this series so far, um, and who is battling high waters in northern New South Wales and busy sandbagging this morning and being here this afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to thank you all, the audience, for making this such a strong professional community across Australia and the Asia Pacific. Um, this Zoom meeting is now going to stay open for the next 15 minutes to allow you to use the chat and connect and see who's still left in the room. Please feel free to make the most of that opportunity. And we invite you and hope to see you next week for the final session, um, fittingly, on futures. Daylight saving ends this weekend in Australia. Um, so we are all on the same time in the East at 2 p.m. AEST. So we look forward to seeing you then. Please do register and please do share with your colleagues um, and friends as well so they can join. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been our absolute pleasure to host you and thank you to the speakers.